Shalom Rastafari and Ne Rasiadinos Tafari name. And this is the Rastafari sabbatical studies for the 17th Torah portion Orit Nabab, known as Yitro or Jethro or Bamarinya as Yotor. Yotor. Now, Yithro or Yitro in English, you know it as Jethro. And this portion begins with the 18th chapter. So let's go to the 18th chapter of Orit Zeat. Orit, the Torah, the Ethiopic Torah of the coming out. And so it's this area right here that you should be viewing. Um, which begins with the first verse, Pesim Ab, Wawel, Wemen Fesit Kadus, Ahadu, Amlak, Ye Mediame Makahin, Ye Muse Amat, Yotor, Egezi Ab Her, Le Muse Na, Le Hizbu, Le Israela, Yadaraga Wino Hulu, Egezi Ab Herim, Israelin, Kagibit Endawet A Semma. And thou wert a semma. When Jethro, the priest of Median, Moses' father in law, when he had heard semma or shema, when he had heard of all that God, Ha Elohim, had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that Yahweh, yod heh wow heh had brought Israel out of Egypt, Kuter Hulet, verse 2, Beziana Gizeh, ye Muse Amata Yotor, Mel Soat, ye Nebrawina, ye Muse Namista Siparan, then Jethro, Yotor, Musa's or Moses' father-in-law took Zipporah or Sipara, Sipara, Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Now, this is some of the family business of Moses here, but it's it's a part of the bigger story. So we're going to move on. And we're here in verse 3. Kuter sos or shos. Kuter su yandinyao sim ger sam nebre. Abatu belela ger sidetenya neberhu beloalina. And her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, or Bamarinya, Gersam, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. So what he says, Belela Agar Sidetenya Nabarhu, I have been a an exile and refuge, uh, like a refugee, one in one in an exile status, in exile. Kuter arat ye huletenya wimasim al azar nebere yabatu amla ka redang kafer onima safe adaneng bilalena. And the name of the other was. Eli Eliezer or Eliazar or Al Azar, El Asar, Asar, Asar or Osiris actually is contained in this when we do the math out of Egypt. But here, Bamarinya, pointing to the Gutas, we have now the proper pointing of the Hebrew Al Azar for God. Of for the God of my father, the Al or the El, the Al Al Azar, the God of my father, said he was mine help, 
was my azar. So we have help here. Now we're getting some of the etymology of this, and Macy, in his work, does a good job on on pointing us in the right direction through the hieroglyphics and and to the root, and even pointing to the the toba Ethiopia for that root. Now we know that Jethro was a Medeanite, and as we said that Yotor being a Medeanite, Median was one of the pro provinces of ancient Tobia, what we know as ancient Ethiopia. So this is why he's also and and Moses' wife, his Ethiopian wife, Sipara, is also called an Ethiopian in that particular contention regarding Moses' sister Miriam or Mariam or Miriam, Old Testament Mariam. But as we go forward, he says that it was the God of my father, the God of my father said he that was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh, from the sword of Pharaoh. Now, this particular Torah portion, let's Let's do some of the basic math on this particular Torah portion. We're, we're going to go forward into this because it, now the portion is the 17th. It's the 17th portion, right? It's the 17th portion. Let's, so let's first of all get a lay of the land. Let's get a lay of the land. Let's get a, a, a basic a basic overview of this particular, what's contained in this particular Torah portion that's known as Jethro or Yitro, 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 Bamarinya in the Amharic, the pure language, the King of Kings, we call it Yotor, Yotor, and that toe, the toe, the the letter, the fidel, if you look at that Bamarinya in the Amharic, and in fact, let's just bring that up for a moment, something very interesting. This is, this is it right here. This is it right here, Yotor. Yotor, and if you look at that center, the center letter is the T O sound, and it looks just like the onk. It's just it's it's a, it's a very interesting um, curiosity. It's a very interesting curiosity there that it looks exactly like the. In fact, let's let's see if we can um, write this. Write this here. Write this here for you, in in um large, in large uh, letters and type because you might not be able to see it so uh, clear at that particular font type. So let's um write this right here. See if we can uh, put this forward. Scribe this forward. To re. Right, and let's see if we can make this a little bit, a little bit larger if possible. All right, let's see if this is all oh, this program. Okay, well, you can't even see that on the screen right there. But Yotor, Yotor, let's let's try one, one more. Let's let's get this. Blank document right here, Sim almost blank document right here. Let's paste this and let's enlarge this to uh, pretty large. Let's go 72 because at 72 that you really will be able to, you know, you really be able to see it, right? Yotor. So you can see this letter right there. The the second letter looks just like an uh, a ankh, Yotor. Now, something interesting when you look at the Hebrew, it's almost as though the the Y, wow, which makes the Y sound, has been shifted to the end. So they say Yitro. So the the O sound is here after the the Ritis or the 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 head sound, the Ras. The r is the r sound from the g is, but this is the toe which looks like an arc. Now, what we have to what we have to understand, and what we should, what we need to understand in the context is that Moses was initiated, that Musa 
was initiated into what we call today uh Ethiopianet or Ethiopianness or the or the faith of the true God, the, the God of the Tob, the Tob Yah. The Tob Yah, Tobijah means the good Jah. If you look up Tobijah, which is the Hebraic of Tobia, which is the archaic or the ancient name of Ethiopia, that truth will become very much clear even when we trace the Amen and we trace the fundamentals of what we know as the, the Hebraic or the right faith, the true faith to its root and even to its shadow reflections in ancient Egypt. We see the Nile River, we see the valley, we see the connection with the river, we see the connection with Moses um, spending much time and in marrying into the Ethiopian family, the faithful Ethiopian family. And we point that out because here we're going to touch on our uh, Shemot, which is the Hebrew book of Exodus, the second Torah portion, which is a compilation of some of the Wikipedia and other available information, but in individual volumes for us and for our children and students and future generations to be able to study as well so they can get an overview. We can catch up on a lot of the lost time like this. So this is what we're going to refer to right here as we've made known in other Vids. Now, the Hebrew for Jethro is Yitro. The Ethiopic for Jethro is Yotor. And now in the Hebrew, according to the Masorah or the traditional um, version of the Old Testament text, it's the second word and it's the first distinctive word in the portion, in the Kufal or the Parsha. Now, this is the 17th weekly Torah portion, reading and feeding in our annual Hebraic or Black, Jewish, and Hebrew cycle of Orit, Nebab, Minbab Torah readings. And it's the fifth in the book of Exodus, or Orit Ze-Se-At. It constitutes Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, to Exodus chapter 20, verse 23. Now, we as, as Ibrawiyan, as Hebrews, as black Jews, as elect Rastafari, faithful Ethiopian Hebrew, in that collective um, Ethiopianet diaspora, so to speak, we read this in the 17th Sabbath, or the 17th Sendet, which this present time right now is this time and the date is uh 2012 the 11th of february the 11th of february now this is the 17th sabbath after the simchat torah a very important um, marker for us in our calculation of time and in our um calendar generally occurs in the late January, depends on the heavens and the alignment, or in February. So we're in February, early February. Now, we as Hebrews and elect Rastafari, we read part of this portion, namely Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to Exodus chapter 20, verse 23, as one of the Orit, the Ethiopic Torah, Nibobs or readings on the first day of the Israelite, the Beta Israel holy day of Shavuot, Shavuot, which is actually what would be known as the harvest, the harvest, which commemorates is the harvest festival, which is the the, the the fourth of the seventh, the one that comes in the midway, the fourth of the seventh. That's also called um um in, in New Testament sense the Pentecoste or Pentecost, which means fifty days, the fifty days. So this is roughly three months after the Exodus, this portion of scripture right here. So though this has just been a so called week or six to seven days since the last portion, in terms of the context of the narrative, it is three months later. 
So part, part of this particular portion, this 17th portion here, Yotar, Jethro, is read chapter 19, verse 1 to chapter 20, verse 23, as the reading for the first day of the Beta Israel, the Hebrew um, holiday of Pentecost or the 50th day, the, the um, Mekar um, or Meher, but we call it Shavuot, Shavuot or Shubai, Shubai, which is, can also be known as a Shubai according to the Ethiopics. And this commemorates the giving, the giving. So Pentecost in essence commemorates the giving of the Ten Commandments. But on the summary, for this portion is two basic two basic parts that we want to teach portion on this right here and then we'll touch on the next portion hopefully in in the other form of the lecture because there's some things that we need to actually be able to outline and use the 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 board for but we're going to use this presentation for for this first portion here so the two portions are one is Jethro he helps to reform the adjudication, the adjudication. And we're going to get into the detail of that, the adjudication. That means how we can govern, you understand, and, and take care of judicial matters, justice for ourselves based on this high, holy, al kidan covenant and the responsibility. But the first responsibility is to get informed and to learn. And then we can get involved and fulfill our our purposes as children of Jah Rastafari, as children of God, and brothers of Jesus Christos. The second part of this is the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. So we hope to also be able to deal within this particular sabbatical week with the Ten Commandments, to really go into teaching and, and learning the real application of it, and, and how it all is not done away with, as many liars and deceivers in counterfeit Christianity want to make you believe that the Ten Commandments are somehow have been done away with. Yes, Jesus Christos fulfilled them, and he showed us how to fulfill them. So in and through the new birth, we are able to be in-laws, but not under the law. And we'll try to explain that as well. But the first portion where Jethro helps to reform the adjudication. Now, M Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, he heard all that Ha Elohim had done for the Israelites. And he brought Moses' wife, his Ethiopian wife, Sipara, Zipporah, and her two sons, Gershom. I have been a stranger here or exile here, and Eliezer, or Al-Azhar, God was my help. So the father-in-law brought the children and, and the wife to the, to the father, the husband, to Moses in the wilderness. And the location, their location was Mount Sinai. So this now brings us to the, to the next... Um, picture right here. This is one of the pictures that are used and have been used to um to uh give a visual a visual um word picture of the mount Mount Sinai. This is the artist rendition of Mount Sinai right here. Right? Artist rendition of Mount Sinai of the Mount of Revelation. Right, and now this right here, we call this our uh, Deborah Damo um, Sinai. This is Deborah Damo, right? And what's so interesting about this flat top Amba, what's known as the Amba, is that as we look at some of the other visual images, what is the other visual images? Even we compare both of these side by side. Let's see if we can do that right here compare these side by side right here. This is the artist. And now something very interesting about the flat top mountains. Now I know ones might be interested and even tempted to go into some of the extraterrestrial 
um, speculations. And we might get into some of that as well, but not initially. First, we want to get the basic, the true idea, and then we can compare it with what we've been hearing about. But one is an artist's image. This is the artist's image here. And this actually is this mouse. You can see very much, you know, the similarity of these particular images. And now we're going to look at the actual that wasn't the actual so-called Mount um, Sinai or Sina. Let's see, where's, where's our other pictures here? Okay, let's see if we can open this up. Be patient. Okay. Now, you know this particular image right here, the um, Bar Marley from Bar Marley's Uprising. But that image of a mountain is very important. The reality of this, now here we call it the Mount of God, this particular image as well. You've probably seen this in some of the previous, you know, uh, videos right here. And uh, what it says in the Mharic, and Yahweh, or the sustainer, Yihin Kal Hulu, this word, completely, indeed, like this, below Tanagara, like this. It was all this word that he spoke because it was at this particular mount that Yahweh had revealed his perfect and pure and the pure and the holy, the holy law to Israel. And in this particular Torah portion, we're going to learn more about this whole process and as we study it, we'll see a link not just to things past, but things present, as well as things future. There's another picture that we have in here that we can't find right now. Let's see if we have to open it up again. But the basic idea is here's where we're, here's where we're moving to. This is where we're moving to. But before that scene, before the Ten Commandments, this is where the Ten Commandments actually um, takes place at that particular point. The Ten Commandments takes place at that particular spot. And it's interesting that in Ethiopia, these holy mountains have the very same shape, the very same um, shape as that in the Holy Land and in that particular, um, in the, this particular Torah portion. So we can't find this right now perhaps we close it up okay so this is th this is where we're heading to but before then before that particular point we have Moses Ethiopian father-in-law seeing a particular situation and this situation is that Moses alone had to deal with the matters concerning the people's problems and her fears. Remember, this came out of Egypt. It's like us coming out of coming out of Babylon, coming out of the West, and now we're in, say, we're in the wilderness of West Africa, and we're moving through that wilderness as a people and as many clans and tribes, just as we are. Don't you think we're going to have a lot of issues? You know, saying there won't be no Judge Mathis and Judge Joe Brown and you know, no uh, Babylonian courts to go to. So where would we get our justice from? So Moses was that was that man. Moses was the one who was dealing with all those issues, big issues and small issues. And, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot much more petty issues. So he was dealing with, see, at this particular point, it's known as, it's still part of the redemption process. And this is part of the experience of redemption. And um, some call it the leaning on the arm of the flesh portion of the particular story. Now, you have to recall that previous to this, there was a conflict against Amalek. And previous to that, the Sabbath was given to Israel. And the portion about the manna, the manna in the wilderness, the stages of hunger are not just behind the people, but that has already been covered in the in the previous um, Sabbath portion, the previous sabbatical reading and feeding. 
So now here we are at the mount of God. You know, now now we're at the mount of God. You understand, which is known. Some say it's the Gebel. This is the picture axe that we were looking for right here. Now, as you can see, it's kind of a faded image. Let's see if we can adjust this and 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 get the. There we go. Look at that. Look at that contrast right there. So sometimes they give you these images and they don't want to give you give it to you too clear. So this is this is that mountain, just like Debradamo, but this is the Gebel uh, Bar uh, Gebel Jebel Barkal or the blessed the blessed mount. And many say this is the Sina or the Sinai where Moses had led the Beit Israel and where the commandments were revealed. Now, that's coming up in chapter 19, but we're here in chapter 18. And we dealt with the intro of it when Jethro, the priest of Median, and Median being related to the ancient Obians or the Ethiopians, and, and we know that now Jethro is one of the faithful. You know what I'm saying? He's one of the, 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 the good the true Ethiopians, in other words, you understand, because he knows that secret and has preserved that true faith in Yahweh. And, and we learn something from this particular portion right here, and what we learn, once we get through the, some of the family, some of the family-related matters, because there's another image as well. Let's see, there's another image as well that we want to share with you. Let's see if we're able to open this image or whether we had changed this up already. There's another image. Um let's go back to the Gebel the Gebel uh we have some Gebel Barkle files right here. So while that searches right there we'll continue with this and we'll bring up that image. So now um when when uh Jethro had came to meet Moses in the wilderness and the location was here at Mount Sinai or Sina, Sina Terara. Jethro Yotor, he rejoiced, he blessed God, and he offered sacrifices to God, according to Exodus 18, chapter 18, verses 9 to 12. Now, this is also very important because in the notes that we have here, in studying and the preparation for this particular sabbatical portion, reading and feeding, um, we went to some of the deeper commentaries, and some Jews, some of the Jews, they debate among themselves what did it mean that Jethro, his Ethiopian Medeanite father-in-law, had heard in, in Exodus 18 and 1 that caused him, some say that he adopted that 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 Jethro, Yotor, adopted the faith of Moses. But, but we disagree that Jethro adopted that faith. It's very clear from the text that Jethro or Yotor already had such faith. And what we clearly see, even from those who came out with Moses, that many who were not Israelites, you understand, still worshipped the God of the Hebrews and they heard the call. You understand? And this is very clear, but there's a lot of, you know, racialism, especially white supremacy that has been superimposed on the scripture. So we as black Hebrews have to be very careful and diligent to, you know, separate that and to deal with the, the facts and the evidence, not to overhype the, the, the racial aspect, you understand, or the so-called... Um, racial biases that the Europeans and many of their best scholars have have fallen to. You understand their Achilles heel, that they say that Jethro adopted the faith of Moses by what was mentioned in eighteen and one because he heard he Shema or Shema. So he, he took the Shema, but it's very clear that he was already in such faith and of such faith already and the truth of the matter is that Musa or Moses actually was initiated into that 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 true Amanyoch or the true worshippers among the, those who truly had Amen 
you know what I'm saying, and, and who worshipped the Amen and who understood, you know what I'm saying, the secret and lived accordingly. So Jethro, Moses' Ethiopian father-in-law, Medianite father-in-law, he was already of the true faith, and it was rather Moses who was further initiated into that faith. And just for the record, both of those were black people, black men, you know, Jethro and Moses. So let's not be confused about that matter any longer. But some say that um, it was that Jethro heard of the Israelites' victory over the Amalekites as was reported in the previous, okay, here this comes up, as was reported in the previous uh, chapter 17. Now, these are some wall paintings right here from uh, Gebel Barkal, from Gebel Barkal, you understand, that I found at this particular site. So it's a well-known ancient Afro-Shemitic site that connects with ancient Egypt, ancient Ethiopia, the ancient Hebrews, that ancient world, so that it's one of the halves of the story that's often suppressed in a lot of the, you know, the biblical rhetoric among whitewashed Anglo-European Christians and, and Jews. But it's something that many of them are beginning to explore in order to try to find more of the truth. And we encourage you to also check up on that. But there were reports that resulted, you understand, concerning the battle, that the Israelites were successful in that particular um, battle against uh, the Amalekites, a group of, we can say, Edomite, Edomites, or you could say Hicksaus or Hekshaus. You understand? I'll say a mulatto. It was the new mulatto people. You understand? Some even have used coin of phrase Obamanites. And in a sense, those were the type of people. And it's not a racial thing against this so called um, mixed group of people. This is why some think that the Hyksos were just white people, or some say that they were just Asian people. Or, and a lot of them are confused because they're not looking at the ancient Egyptian. Record. If you look at the ancient Egyptian record, even if we were to look up Hyksos right here, we can show you actual wall paintings and monuments that show the different racial types. And th there were groups that, for different reasons, would pull together that, that were not so much of a particular racial type. It's like Americans today. A lot of people say they're Americans and they just came from a foreign so-called country and got citizenship, but they consider themselves Americans. And if you took a snapshot of these individuals, they would look just like the Hyksos. Anyway, it reports that Jethro heard of the news in Exodus 18.1, where we begin this portion. Now, um, some say that Jethro had heard of the giving of the Torah, that, that God had gave Israel the Torah, and the sound traveled from one end of the earth to the other, and that all the world's kings and all the kingdoms and, and all their palaces, they, they, they sang the words of Psalm 29 and 9. The voice of the Lord makes the hinds to tremble, and in his temple all say glory or misgana. The kings then converged, some say on Balaam, on their heathen prophets. You know, they went to their religious leaders about the tumultuous noise that they had heard. Perhaps it was another flood or perhaps it was a flood of fire. It's something like where we're living right now and how we're living right now in 2012. Everybody's wondering what's going to happen. And there's people giving various different um interpretations or speculations, but Balaam told them that Balaam, who was touched by Jah, Balaam told them that that the true God had a precious treasure in store, which God had hidden, had hidden for countless generations, some say 974 generations before the creation of the world, and that Jah desired to give it to Jah's children, according to Psalm 29 and 11, where it says that Yahweh will give strength to his people.
people. He will give power to his people. Immediately they all exclaim the balance, the ma'at of Psalm 29, 11, where it says that Adonai, a gizyari here, that Yahweh, Baruch Hu, will bless his people with salam, with peace. I'm talking about true peace, not this peace, peace you keep hearing on TV and, and out in the world and everybody says peace, but you, what you experience is anything but peace. Their, their peace, peace is a sudden destruction, but we're speaking about the true peace that comes in the fulfillment of this new age. I'm talking about when Christ, when the Messiah, when Jah Rastafari takes over the realm of governance fully, when this system has worn itself out, when there are no more spokes on the wheel of creation, when time has run out. That's why there's so much war, mayhem, chaos, because Satan, the devils, and the demon-possessed people, they know they only have a short period of time, and many are fainting and, 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 and uh, are, are perishing because of the fear of what's, what's going to happen. So fear is killing a portion of them, but Yahweh is going to give true peace to and through his people. Now, Jethro had heard about the dividing of the Red Sea. He heard about what Yahweh did through Moses in the Red Sea. It's like if you have a student, right? If you're a disciple, and of, of, or better yet, you're, 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 you're a master, and you're teaching a disciple, and that disciple is good, you know, and that disciple has a calling, like Moses had a calling, even in the wilderness, the burning bush. And then he goes through with it, and not only does he get his people out, but in a dramatic way. I mean, you can see that he was not only an initiate, but he became, as Acts of the Past, I think 722 says something to the effect of that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts, and he was a man mighty in word and in deeds. It's like you can graduate knowing the knowledge, you're learning the knowledge and being able to regurgitate it now to actually execute it in unique and difficult situations. Jethro had heard, you understand, and he came forward to bless Yahweh. You understand? Joshua 5 and 1, it reports that, and it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites heard how Yahweh had dried up the waters of the Jordanos before the Bekik Israel, and Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute, you understand, Rahab, she too had told Joshua's spies in Joshua 2 and 10, Joshua also known from the ancient Egyptian mystery or the mysteries as Shu. What we have before you is Ma and Shu, which is another level of the teaching. But Joshua's spies were told by Rahab, um, the prostitute, the harlot, for we have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea, of the Sea of Reeds, the Yam Suf, that that word had went all over. You understand? This is why when you look in different mythologies, it sounds a lot like what the Bible is talking about, but people are explaining it in their own ways and changing names. Of It's like when they do in these movies and TV shows, they say that the characters have been fictionalized. They bear no resemblance to real people. What they've done is took, taken our story and spun it in so many different cultures all over the all over the world. Macy's book, Gerald Macy's book, A Book of the Beginnings, is a good introduction to that. Um, but Exodus 18 and 6 now is it teaches us that Jethro sent a messenger. Some say interpreted that Jethro sent a messenger to Moses, noting that 18 and 6 mentions each of uh, of Jethro, Zipporah, Sipar, and Moses' children. Now, some of the ancient Arabis, they taught that Jethro had sent Moses a letter or some written communication asking Moses to come out to meet Jethro for Jethro's sake. And should Moses be unwilling to do so for Jethro's sake, then do so for Zipporah's sake. 
And should Moses be reluctant to do so for her sake, then do so for the sake of the children. Now, it's very clear when you read Exodus chapter 18 that it's the father-in-law now who brings the wife and the children. It's, it's, it's a very interesting situation. Not much is going into it, but it's clear that when Moses went about his mission, that he separated himself from his wife and from his children. Now, others state that when Jethro said, Bless be the Lord, Jethro said, Bless be, be Yahweh, Yahweh Baruch Hu. He said, Bless be him in Exodus 18 and 10. This was actually to reproach the Israelites. This is to reproach them in a sense to not insult them for insulting sake, but to to show them that, listen, Yahweh is on, Jah is on your side, and you don't even know it. It's almost like when all the other nations recognize the light of Rastafari and Negroes still won't get it. You know, it's almost like the same kind of thing when you think about it. You know, so Jethro, by by saying that some rabbis have interpreted that that was to reproach the Beit Israel for their lack of faith, for not one of the 600 or so thousand Israelites rose to bless God, that none of them, we don't hear any of them saying, hey, hallelujah, bless be Baruch Hu, for look what he did for us. That No, they were complaining about food, and they were complaining about, they were a little bit hungry, they were a little bit tired and everything like that. They did not know what freedom, true freedness really was. That's interesting. That genera that first generation did not know what that was. It's just like when we talk about the events that occurred in the 60s, the work of the King of Kings. Most Negroes, that's so... It's only us as the children's children are beginning to comprehend the significance of that. And I'm sure on the other side of the flood, you know, with the Ethiopians and that careless Ethiopian generation, this new generation of Ethiopians are beginning to, you know, relook at the story, relook at the history, and, and they're having a greatly different interpretation you understand, of of the facts of the matter and, and see what was lost. But moving on, so we're at Exodus chapter 18, verses 9 to 12. Let's just go over here, bring this up. Exodus chapter, chapter um, 18, chapter 18, verses 9 to 12. Now we say in verse, it's in verse... Um, Who's at verse 5? So let's get to verse 5 right here. So it says, Yeah, Muse, yeah, yeah, Muse Amat, Yotorin, Kal Jochuna, Kamistu Gar, Be Exiavi Hir Terara at Egeb, Be Mizre Beda, Wode Sephre, Wode Muse Meta. And Jethro Moses' father in law, the Amat, he came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness. Notice it said, you don't say he came for his grandson. He said he came for his uh, you understand? He came with Moses, you know, but still, the point is the children are the children are the children. You know, like we have this thing about like 35 degree cousin or something like that. It's just n nonsense. But this is, that's what it is living in a spiritual Egypt. But um, it says where he encamped, it says right here, at the Mount of God. So the place that he encamped, we have it in verse 5, you know, saying which justifies this particular word pick right here that, that it says that he encamped at the Mount of of God. So even in that time it was known that God had a particular mount, a particular mount of of revelation we're going to find out as we move a little bit forward and further. Uh Kuter uh, Sidis verse six says Musenim Ine Amatihi Yotor Mistehim Karswam Gara Hula Tula Jochua met tena lehal alo, and he said to Moses, "I, thy father-in-law Jethro, am come to 
unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. And it says that, and Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare. And they came into the tent. Kutera sabat musem amatuna lia genang weta segadam samawim Arusbarsacha wema de hinne tacha wina tet eyayaku, wode dinner quanum gabbu. So, this is interesting here because we're seeing etiquette. We're learning a little bit about etiquette here as well. And the etiquette is that so Jethro announces himself, right? Jethro brings the children, brings the family because he kept them. You know, he kept them safe. Moses had a mission for God, for the people, you understand, for even generations far off that wasn't even yet born, speaking of I and I. Now Jethro, Yotor, comes forward. Moses goes out to meet his father-in-law. He does obeisance, or he prostrates, segadem, and he prostrates, and he bows himself, you understand, and so, it, it, see, a lot of us say, oh, don't bow, uh, I won't bow, like, I won't bow to nobody, you know, like, look at these things because of being confused and bondage and don't even recognize that civility that truly free people, you know what I'm saying, truly free people, and says so they kissed and kissed him, you know what I'm saying, and kissed him. We see this go on in the East, and people would think, oh, those men must be gay because they're kissing each other. See, that's because ones are living uncivilized or at best half civilized out here in the West. And they ask each other of their welfare. According to their, their like we say, they ask each other. Of that, so we see this in some who have um, uh, maybe met and greeted um, uh, Ethiopians who still carry yeah chop yawi net kubur. You understand? In that sense, know that there is some say that the greeting can go on for a moment. You know, asking how you doing, how's your family, how's this one, a hugging, kissing, greeting one another. But that's a part of the etiquette. And these things we must learn again if we are to be a free people, especially to be a people of the true God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. Kuter cement. Musame Egiziavi here be for onna be Gutawian lai, Sile is Raya Yadaragoin Hulu, the men Gedema Ya Genacho win, Dikam Hulu Egiziavi herin, in Dada Nacho, be le le amatu negro. And Moses told his father in law all that Yahweh had done to fer on and to the Egyptians for, because of the sake of Israel, Jah's son, Jah's son, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and all that they've experienced in some of the previous chapters, and how Yahweh delivered, how he delivered them, how he, in Dadan Nacho, how he was their Adonai, how he Save them, how he rescued them. Kuter that ain't your turn, a gizia here, le is rail, sladder, go, churnet, hulu, kagit awiane, my ja sladanacho, desalo. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness, the churnet, the generosity, the open handedness which Yahweh, which Ja, which Yah, had done to Israel, whom he had delivered or rescued, showed himself as Adonai, as the one that Adana, you understand, the Madane, delivered out of the hand of 
the Egyptians. Now, verse 10, and don't get this twisted. The Egyptians were, in ancient time, these ancient Egyptian black people. And the Medeanites, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian, uh, you know, the Ethiopian, Noch, they also black people. And the Beta Israel, also black people. So we're speaking about all black people here. Because when we talk about, okay, what the Egyptians were doing and how Yahweh had to deal with the Egyptians, some of, some of the so-called um, modern um, Egyptologists, Folk, black folks who who might just have a, a a smack dab of the truth, they get a little bit offended. They're like, "Oh, is the Moses stole this and stole that?" And they don't even know what the accent. Do you know Ethiopic? Then you don't know the root of ancient Egypt. So shh and learn. Yotarim kagut awiyana kaferone ij yadanachu ka. And Jethro said, Bless be Yahweh. So, see, Jethro wasn't so called adopted the faith of Moses like the so called white Jews say in their commentary. You understand? He was already in that faith. You understand? So you didn't say, hey, Moses, how you did this? Who's your God? You know, he didn't have to go through any of that. You know, he said, blessed be Yahweh, who have delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who have delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now, the so-called Egyptians... At this time, we cannot look at every generation of Egyptians to be the same generation. This particular generation, it's like when we look at so-called um, different nations. We look at uh, pre careless Ethiopia before the so-called revolution against our godfather and king of kings. You understand? So we can see in different times there were the careful Ethiopian, there were the careless Ethiopians. Now we had the the good Egyptians, and now we have the bad Egyptians. You know, people change. Different times bring out the better or the worse out of different people. It's much like what we are going through presently, even right now. Now, the important aspect to understand right here, as, we, as we're moving forward, you understand, is that Jethro or Yotor, you know, Jethro, he knew who Yahweh was, that, that, that Jethro, was, Jethro wasn't a stranger, you understand, to Yahweh. You understand? He blessed Yahweh. You understand? Why? How do we know that he was no stranger? Because both the, the great-grandfather of the Medeanites and the great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather of the Israelites is Abraham. They both share Abraham or Abraham in common. This, this, is the, this is the link. This is the important and the key link in the story. So the Medeanites are also Hebrews. And the true God of the Hebrews is yod Hey wow Hey is Yahweh. You understand? Is Jah, as we say today in the Anglo-Saxon way, is Jah. And the revelation that we have in this particular time, of course, is Jah Ras Tafari, in and through the King of Kings, Kedamawi Haila Selassie. So we need to comprehend that, Raithi. That, that needs to be well understood because a lot of folks not comprehending that and having, and having um, a, a, a faulty contextualization of that are not able to really receive the truth of what the story is saying because they don't have the basic matters, you understand, the basic matters in its proper, in its proper context. So we were looking for another picture right here. We don't have a particular picture for Jethro, you understand, um, although any, any Kushite, honorable Kushite type, you understand, more like the Merrill way, 
you know, saying the Merway type, because that's where a residue of the kingdom of, of those people after they were pushed across the Red Sea by the invading Hindi Hindi type Arabs, you know, or pale Arabs that actually pushed them back across to the other side of the Red Sea. But that's a, as we say, that's a, another story. So here we're at the Mount of God, right? Here we're at this particular Mount of God. Now, as we go on in the, in from verse 11, Jethro continues and says, Now I know that Yahweh, he says, Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all gods, than all of the so-called Elohim in heaven or in earth. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So this is, this is a very interesting key. So he knew that something had gone wrong in Egypt. Many people knew. It's just that some of these um, Afrocentrics and, and, and ones all caught up into everything Kamite, Kemite is good and there's no problem. They don't really want to look at the story honestly. They don't understand the importance of this because the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, black people, the Medeanites, Black people called Ethiopians always been black people, right? And the Israelites, Beta Israel, like the Falashes over there, and like the so-called Negroes over here, black people. So all these are black people. So let's just un understand that. So here he says to beat by the regubacho negarek giziavi her kamalikt hulu and di bellet ahun awepuhu ale. So he says that in that which they had dealt proudly. So, so you know, when the scripture teach and the wisdom books teach that pride goes before a fall, you understand, but humility before honor. This is the principle that Jethro is, is speaking of right here. It's interesting that he mentioned that word to Ibit. He's speaking about for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. He was superior in the Belit. You understand? He was superior to them. Kut Asara Hulet Yemuse Amat Yotorim Yemik at Ella Mesh Owa Itina Leila Mesh Owa Itin La Egeziavi Hera Wesede the Egeziavi Harim feet Kamuse Amat Gar in Gerali Bellu Aron Yesaralim and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God, for Elohim, Ha Elohim. And Aaron came and all of the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So you, we can see how all this is in the family. This is one of the most powerful testimonies when we speak about um, uh, Ethiopianess or Ethiopianism or, or Ethiopianism in that sense. You, this, is, this is the crux. This is the foundation right here. So no one had to tell Jethro how to, you know, uh, take a burnt offering or to do sacrifices or to bless Yahweh. We don't have no translator running around here who has to translate for them. So that means they all are speak of the same speak of the same or a similar or a similar or a similar language. Um but be that as it yeah, but be that as it but be that as it may, um so this is this is one portion